Thanks for joining us. Uh, we're going to have an interesting discussion this afternoon under the title of Airlines in Transition, Pushing the Boundaries, Facing the Challenges. Well, I guess over the years, airlines have faced enormous numbers of challenges. I think the last decade seems to have been particularly difficult. We've had volcanic eruptions, we've had SARS, we've had terrorism outrages, financial meltdowns. And not all airlines are up to the, up to the fight. Uh, those who survive really have to be tough. They have to know what they're doing. We've seen revisions of strategy, uh, new business models emerging. So we're going to speak to a couple of industry survivors today who themselves have faced significant challenges and indeed have plenty on their respective uh, uh, list of difficulties today, but are surviving and indeed uh, prospering. Now, I thought I'd just mention a quote from a former airline CEO. I think it was uh, the ex-CEO of uh, Air Canada, Gary Milton. He described the life as a pilot uh, of, of being years of boredom punctuated by minutes of sheer panic. He described the life of an airline CEO as minutes of boredom punctuated by years of sheer panic. So with that little uh, merry note, I'd like to welcome to the stage our two industry veterans who've experienced those years of sheer panic and yet still survived. First of all, Peter Davis from uh, Air Malta, Chief Executive of Air Malta, and Christoph Muller, Chief Executive of Air Lingus. Peter, welcome to the stage and welcome to WTM. Christoph, welcome to the stage. Well, you are surviving. You are, I guess, uh, industry veterans. You both worked at uh, numerous airlines. You've got more hair than I have, though. So. You've got hair, though, as far as I can see. I couldn't say it even looked like they're uh, glued on. But it's a real item, even if there's little colour left around the edges. <laughs> both of you have got... Uh, both of you have had financial... I'm not trying to insult you from the beginning. Sorry about that. <laughs> you've both had financial results out. Christoph, today, in fact, you've been in London uh, talking to the markets about your third quarter results. And, Peter, you had your... Year-end results up to the end of March out uh, just about a week ago in the first, first quarter or first half, indeed, first of, half, indeed. Uh, of this year. Christoph, just broadly, before we get into a deeper discussion, what did your results show uh, in outline terms today? Yeah, quarter three for Ellingus was, uh, was successful. <clears throat> in fact, it was the highest ever uh, quarterly result we had announced, 95 million for the three months uh, past. Uh, still, we were not happy. We had a very hot summer in Ireland, uh, so outbound was suffering a little bit. Informed the market, uh, profits are still a little bit down, but we still had for 60 million profit uh, towards the end of the year. Uh, long haul performing very well, short haul affected due to the weather um, and uh, some more aggressive pricing we have experienced in the last couple of weeks. How about you, Peter? How was your year end? And yeah, it was good. Uh, we, we're in the, so the second year of our five year restructuring plan. Which we'll come back to in a, a uh, And uh, we, we, yeah, we inherited a, a loss of 50 odd million uh, on a 200 million company a couple of years ago. We got it down to an operational loss of 13, uh, which is good progress and in line with what we submitted to Brussels. And uh, the first six months of the current financial year, uh, since 2007, uh, we, we made a net net profit of 2.9 million. So. Uh, we crept over that uh, all-important line. So, again, like Christoph, we're not uh, rejoicing. Uh, we, we feel comfortable and confident, but it's uh, huge amounts of work still to be done. Well, we heard, heard a lot of uh, media noise yesterday about Ryanair's results, and uh, as you were mentioning there, Christoph, about the, the summer weather in Northern Europe. And, Peter, when we were just chatting before we came in here, you were saying you were on the, uh, the other end of this weather problem, while Aer Lingus would be flying people to uh, its Mediterranean destinations, you would be flying them to your home in Malta. I mean, do you both feel it was fair, what I said in the introduction, that we have had more crises in recent years? Is, is weather just another one of these things? That we, we don't expect this weather pattern. Is this going to be another challenge for the industry, or is this a one-off, Christoph? Uh, well, now, after four years in Ireland, I think I come to the conclusion three things we don't like. We don't like snow, ash, clouds, and sun. So our revenue grow best in rain, obviously. And, uh, but again, I mean, we have the first time in five years really competition in Europe. Uh, let's not forget that. It was most probably stimulated by that weakness in the market. Mm -hmm. And uh, very surprisingly, the outcome of that entire exercise um, is, and we saw that yesterday in the result announcement, simulation is not working any longer. And that is a big surprise for, I think, everybody in the market. Uh, the market leader, Ryanair, has uh, stimulated the market with a 20% um, blanket uh, reduction across Europe, Scandinavia to Malta, uh, Spain to yeah. Poland, and has generated only 5% additional passengers. So the entire model of stimulating market is broken. 
Why is that? We still have some question marks, but uh, certainly some markets are saturated. Mm -hmm. Um, the amount of migrant workers, which has always been a target for the ultra-low cost carriers because this is the pri most price sensitive segment, um, is not traveling uh, as much as before. So I think that we, we are really in for, uh, for a step change. Saturation is one of the uh, key words we have to discuss and overcapacity. And, and Peter, do you, do you have a similar yeah, I mean, the set changes, I, I, I think you, you mentioned three or four items there. I think the airline industry, if you go back over many years, always has these catastrophes and, and we sort of lurch from one problem to another. Um, having said that, we, we, we obviously have to manage those processes. As far as uh, we're concerned, I, I think that uh, you know, air mortar is a destination airline, so we have a different perspective. We're, we're obviously trying to attract people down there. So in answer to your specific question about July, uh, yeah, we had a pretty poor July because uh, with the hot weather in this part of the world, people uh, decided not to travel, so therefore it had a big impact on us. Um, but having said that, I think the, the, the opportunities, uh, specifically from a niche operator, which is where air water is, uh, is, is quite substantial in terms. So we still look for, uh, for a lot of growth. Uh, but I think certainly there's been a significant step change. And I think Ryanair and the way that they're reacting by, you know, with Michael saying he's going to be nice to people now um, and uh, you know, hopefully increases the profits as a result of that is quite significant. I think there's obviously a lot more behind that than uh, simply being nice to people. But if we look at the, the long-term trend in the industry, it, it's an upward growth trend. But we saw, I mean, thinking back over roughly this, this decade or so that I'm talking about, I remember the massive drop, the massive, uh, you know, like, a, like a hit to the stomach when 9-11 when happened. Uh, the other examples like SARS or the whole European industry indeed ricocheting around the world when the volcano forced everybody to stop. Um, fuel prices, of course, is something that fluctuates up and down, mainly up for the long term. But do you feel as, as airline leaders that this has led to a change in management mindset that the ones that are going to survive have got to do things differently to how they did it in the past? Well, I, I think those, those people who have been forced into a position where they're lo losing money and about to go bankrupt, they've had to. But I, I'm still surprised by a number of airlines around the world, uh, the, the level of management complacency uh, in terms of uh, will it be all right on the night. So I, I think, in my experience, airlines don't react until they're forced to. Uh, and, and having said that, there's a lot of airlines in Europe, certainly at the moment, uh, which are very close to bankruptcy and are being forced to make changes. The question is, how do they make those changes? Do you get approval uh, through the, uh, the state aid? and to what extent can they survive. Uh, Overcapacity in the market is there to a certain extent. The whole sea change in terms of point-to-point -point traffic, feeder traffic, that the whole gambit of how airlines operate within the European theatre uh, is changing and changing, changing quite substantially. And uh, at the end of the day, you've got to make a profit. And that's, as mm -hmm. you know, a very difficult well, I'm, I'm surprised in some ways that you say about complacency. I mean, uh, do, do you agree with that, Christoph? Because I, I would have said if there are less around, I mean, you, you know, we'll come back to more detail of the business plan you're taking at Malta through, we'll talk about Air Links' history, but it, I would have said it seems to me the opposite, that now there's less complacency because maybe there was complacency before. Christoph? Uh, well, it would be so easy if an airline management team had the thought and it would be implemented at the same point in time. So I think the plan and the execution nevertheless are two different things. But my reading is that uh, in large parts of Europe we are facing a missed opportunity such that 2009 was a disaster everywhere. Um, everybody was in contraction but uh, in Ireland we still haven't recovered from a 30% drop in demand. So still the market is basically on 2008 levels. Whereas, let's take Germany for an example, they rebounced in 2010 mm. and had their best year ever. And of course, on that soil, you cannot grow uh, any sense of urgency which makes your employees, your shareholder, your passengers understand that something needs to change. Mm. And that is it, the, the, uh, the, the lost opportunity, particularly the legacy carrier is suffering from, because the picture is quite similar in Spain, in France, in, uh, in Germany, and uh, Italy, uh, of course, uh, also to be mentioned. They all suffer from a lost opportunity to use really the crisis as a, as a catalyst event uh, in order to change. Well, well, well maybe that does that's, build that's, on that's your the, point. That's the element of complacency I'm mm -hmm. referring to. I was going to say, maybe that does build on your point, because that's if we right. look, uh, <coughs> uh, and I don't know who we have in the audience, but if we look at um, you know, the, the Air France KLM group, uh, uh, they've been much more cautious in making changes, uh, both in terms of the level of workforce uh, reduction, productivity, 
Lufthansa, and, and maybe just look, looking back to your, your, your country heritage, Christoph, here, I mean, do, do you think they uh, should have pushed harder? They've put a lot of their short haul operation into the German wings operation, but I remember in the media last year, they faced some strikes and they seem to step back all the time. Okay, we will give you uh, permanent contracts, we will give you this pay increase. Uh, is that what you're getting at? You cannot ask me as a specialist for Germany, I left it too long ago, <laughs> but what I see right now, um, I mean, Germany has accumulated such a wealth that in the current discussion about the Grand Coalition, it's more about the distribution of wealth which has been accumulated. There is absolutely no mindset from the top to the bottom uh, for painful change. And in that environment, it will be extremely difficult. I appreciate that things like German wings uh, are done, uh, similar Transavia, uh, similar uh, Vueling, Iberia Express. I think it's the same recipe uh, everywhere else. Mm -hmm. But I believe the more successful ones have one thing in common. They are still haven't embarked from the crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, Spain is a very good example. I think the inroads IG has made in order to turn that around is, is quite remarkable, uh, but so different to... Uh, to uh, Germany or France, where the, the problem presenting itself is exactly the same. Well, one of the biggest issues, I think, in, in, in creating these changes uh, is, is the, the element of culture. Uh, within, uh, within air mortar, 70% um, of what we had to do uh, was a cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. It was creating the sea of change. Just, just setting the context, I mean, I guess, is it fair to say, before you uh, took uh, tenure with air mortar, was pretty well on the edge of bankruptcy. It was, it was bankrupt. It was bankrupt, yeah. technically. The, the government of the day had to, uh, to seek a 52 million rescue aid. Uh, rescue, in my language, means that we had to save it. Uh, and, and it was close to bankruptcy. So we had to concentrate on making sure we could build a, shore up those, uh, those finances and the operations so at least we could uh, uh, make the company survive uh, so we could get the restructuring plan down and get the approvals. But I th the, 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 the cultural element is, is often misunderstood, uh, I, I think. And it's not just leveled at management mm -hmm. in that sense. I think complacency is, uh, is quite critical in this industry. But I think it's the capability of the softer issues of management uh, to convince people, uh, unions and others, uh, that, that life is changing. And we've had a significant battle, uh, which I think we've partly won within the company, uh, to convince uh, you know, a bunch of people that, that life has got to change. Uh, now, many air other airlines have gone through that. Uh, some years ago, but it seems that they need to go through it again. Okay. And we talk about these big airlines, and, and that's the element of complacency and cultural revolution, which I think the, the world is changing and changing rapidly. And we haven't even talked about the golf carriers yet, and, and uh, you know, people don't seem to be sort of wake, well, they're woken up to it, but they're not quite sure what to do. But does it and, mean and in all honesty, after uh, 25 years in the industry, I could, in retrospective, not identify a single year where you could have said as an airline manager, now it's enough. Exactly. You know, let's pause for some time. Mm -hmm. Let's enjoy the the laurels. No, it's uh, it's like in sport. You have to train every day. It's a very painful thing, which requires a lot of discipline, but also a lot of loyalty of your of your employees to the company, because you know we are all in for the long term, and uh, that needs to be hammered down. Well, I think you, you're both highlighting really. Maybe that is one of the issues of challenge, and to reflect on what you said, Christoph, the difference between IAG's progress arguably further ahead than, say, Lufthansa or, or certainly Air France KLM. And thinking of the, the, what I could term the, the Woolly Walsh style of management, and I want to ask you too if you are <laughs> of the Woolly Walsh school of management, but by using a quote, paraphrasing a quote I remember seeing him make in a programme once when he said, many CEOs like to stand in front of their staff and give them the good news. I would rather stand in front of my staff and give them the truth, and the truth is not always the good news. Christoph. I cannot agree more. That that is basically, sure. and that is also something we have experienced in Erlingus when uh, when we arrived as a new team. The relationship between uh, management and employees was was truly broken. There was mistrust because um, previous management had tried to tranquilize the pain of change with <laughs> false promises. Uh, mm. Nobody no, could yeah, deliver. Sure. Yeah. And you rather promise less but deliver on it. Um, and, and that takes, of course, a whole cycle. You know, uh, if you promise something which is three years out, you at least have to wait three years until uh, you, you, you can refer to it. And uh, the truth, I believe, will always prevail, so you better start right away. And, and do you think that has been accepted? Because uh, you've both 
had or are having problems with groups of staff? Is this an ongoing challenge? I mean, you, you know, just today there's been some media coverage about cabin crew strike threats in Aer Lingus. You've had some pilot kind of uh, sick outs a couple of weeks ago, Peter. Is it a constant thing to have to keep this going? And uh, will it ever be overcome? Will there ever be a permanent meeting of minds between workforce and management? I, it's not very complicated. I, 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 I'm a great believer in Mr. McCorber from David Copperfield. You know, the difference between happiness and unhappiness is a penny. Uh, and I'm pretty unhappy at the present moment. Uh, and obviously, Christoph is delighted, so, uh, but, not, but not complacent. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, it, it, of course, every day is, uh, is a challenge. But I think it's two things that are important. One is you, you talk about the, 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 uh, being honest in front of your uh, staff. Absolutely right. Completely support that. But I think even before you do that, you have to stand up in, with yourself in front of your own mirror and look at yourself and make sure that you're giving uh, an honest opinion. There's too many CEOs tend to uh, believe in their own marketing, in my opinion, and they get very complacent about that. Um, we're talking about the softer issues of management here. It's about putting people through, not pushing people through. Anyone can kick bottoms. That's not difficult. Mm. Um, but the art of putting people through and convincing them uh, logically and sometimes emotionally um, is, is something we face, uh, face every day. Secondly, I think it, 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 this industry, I think, from a customer service perspective, is often misunderstood. You know, if you buy a car or an iPhone, uh, you know, iPhones assembled in China, I have no <laughs> idea what that factory looks like. I've never been there. I, I can only imagine um, the people working there, how long it takes to put an iPhone together. I have no idea. Um, but you don't see it as a consumer. When you're a, a passenger on my airline, or Chris will say, you are in my factory. You are exposed to the production. So everyone sees all the foibles. And if and, uh, you know, something goes wrong and lots of things go wrong in our industry, uh, the customer sees it being fixed. So that requires also a different perspective from management, uh, but equally from employees. They must understand. Um, and and uh, you know, there's a classic example at London City this morning. Uh, the, the aircraft I went to, which airline I was flying, to be unfair. Um, but I pitched up, and, and um, you could see the ground crew running uh, from, uh, from, their, from their hut. And, and yeah, we took another two or three minutes on stand. Passengers see that. So I think, in terms of trying to convince people that there's a uh, Significant change is required in the industry. It has to start from the top, but people have to understand it intellectually. But I think it would be unfair to reduce the entire uh, problems of the airline industry to, to a labor relation sure, issue. Yeah. Of course. And that is basically equal treatment. I believe staff uh, reasonably enough expect that I negotiate as hard as with them, with the airport authorities, mm. with the aircraft manufacturers, with all suppliers. So. At the end of the day, it's a special factor because it delivers a service at the same point in time. Um, but you have to find a balanced solution. And I'm, I'm truly committed to a certain quota termination. Um, and we have been very successful in Erlingus. Um, I can just praise our staff for you know, the sacrifice they were able to take. And now we can enjoy the outcome uh, uh, jointly. That's a much better feeling and, and, and having it just single-sided. Hmm. Well, you, you mentioned, I mean, other suppliers there. And I mean, on the one hand, you could say there's a, a certain marriage between the management of an airline and its staff, and especially delivering the, the frontline ex experience with the passengers. And another marriage that just made me think about, and, and re reading through uh, things you're both involved in currently, another kind of marriage you can't live with and you can't live without is with airports. Mm -hmm. Now, you've commented recently, for example, on your relationship with your home airport, uh, Malta, and the need to get changes there. Christoph, you just delivered a, a presentation a little over a month ago at a conference, and you, you made a point very clearly about airports' roles. It, 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 can you both elaborate a bit on your thoughts on that relationship and issues of cost and balance of power or relationship? Christoph, if you could start. Yeah, we have, of course, a couple of very prominent cases just here in front of our door, the most recent ruling of the CEA with regard to the Heathrow charges. So we have to make a differentiation whether an airport is regulated or whether you can, like in the United States, just you know negotiate at arm's length. Mm. Um, but nevertheless, infrastructure is important. Uh, more and more, I believe, uh, we are moving away from marble palaces uh, because the customer spends, hopefully, the shortest time of the entire travel experience in an airport so why do you make it fantastic uh, um, so I, I hope that the entire investment behavior of the large airport companies will change over time particularly here in Europe in, in going more to functional things to bring the cost down um, airport ownership is an issue uh, most of the airports are still in state ownership which of course gives them certain limitations in negotiating costs 
Um, it's a huge issue, but at the end of the day, they remind monopolies. And that makes it so difficult uh, to negotiate. Even in London, where we have now six airports with a London designator, there is no true competition uh, between Luton and Stansted and, 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 and Gap. Why would you say that? Just to explain, uh, why would you say they don't compete? Because you know, we've just had a breakup here of uh, BAA yeah. uh, on the, 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 uh, the mantra of competition. Like, this will give competition, it's good for the market, good for consumers, good for airline. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is not the case, even with these six airports with London? Because they are simply different products. I mean, you can impossibly com uh, compare City with Heathrow, and even Heathrow and Gatwick. Uh, one has uh, fantastic train access, but no road, and the other, the, the other way around. Uh, these are uh, completely different products. One has connectivity, the other not, um, and so on and so forth. So it's, it's relatively difficult for us as airlines to leverage one airport with the other and simply say, you know, if you don't agree to my pricing, we go, because slots, is, of course, a very important thing. Um, to cut a long story short, what I said at the conference is if airports want to enjoy more traffic, uh, particularly the established airports, let's take a continental European airport as an, as a, as an example, you know, it's Zurich or Charles de Gaulle or Brussels or something like that. If they want to attract more point-to-point -point traffic from low-cost carriers, they have to lower the barriers of entry. Otherwise, a very ironic thing is taking place High air cost charges protect the legacy carriers from the low cost carriers. For sure, yeah. And that is already taking place, and that is an irony, if you wish, and particularly an irony, a sour irony for the consumer. Peter, uh, talk about your situation in Malta. Well, uh, in Malta, we, we, we uh, only have one runway in the whole country, so uh, <laughs> I, unless I put sea legs on, I suppose. But uh, no, we, we have a, a good relationship with uh, Malta International Airport, but it, it's, it's a robust relationship because uh, they, they make a huge amount of money. Um, I think at the end of the day, it, it, there's this big debate, isn't it, as opposed to going back to my days uh, where we operated through Brussels, uh, is who is the customer from the airport's perspective? Uh, years ago, it used to be the airline, but that's shifted tremendously you know, to the point that I think, uh, I can't remember the quote now, but I think, was it two-thirds of, of uh, Heathrow's revenue or airline, the airport's revenues comes from, uh, from the rental rather than the landing fees? So mm -hmm. the whole shift uh, is, is quite significant. And the relationship between ourselves and, uh, and the airport has, has suffered to a certain extent as a result of that. They just assume that we're going to keep on coming. And, uh, and if we're not there, someone else will, will fill that spot. But the, the different products, uh, we, we fly into Heathrow and we fly into Gatwick. Uh, we have no intention of flying into the other uh, London airports because it's not the right product for air water. Um, so I think there are differentiating uh, uh, circumstances. Which, uh, but one of the areas where, where airport charges has played out, uh, and this is um, you know, an inevitable rearing of the head of Ryanair, is, is Ryanair moving into a whole number of airports around Europe and pushing hard on the airport charges. Um, you have, I want to look at maybe Ryanair in a number of aspects, uh, not surprisingly. In terms of competition, you've got Ryanair cheap by jowl right next to you in Malta with a, a base. I don't know, a couple of, a couple of aircraft, aircraft based yeah. air, flying to a range of routes. Has that been a, a nightmare to have to confront as a, as a home carrier or is it something you've adapted to and... Uh, no, I, I, it was a nightmare for uh, for Air Malta when they first came in because Air Malta didn't didn't uh, you know didn't change. They they uh, they put their head in the sand uh, and, and added cement, uh, so uh, with their bottoms in the air. So that, that proved the problem, which then created this almost bankruptcy. Um, now, from my point of view, the, the biggest competition to Air Malta is Air Malta. Uh, so, on behalf of the country, they need to attract as many flights in as possible because uh, of the opportunity. You know, uh, tourism represents 35% of the GDP, so it's important. Um, but we have a position in life, not a god even right, we have to uh, earn our, our right and, uh, and uh, after the state aid we have to make profits. Um, but I, I don't see that as, as uh, a, a major problem. Other people see that as a major problem. Um, but I think uh, we have to fight uh, alongside uh, Ryanair, EasyJet, Wiz, British Airways are going to come back uh, out of Gatwick uh, um, uh, next uh, IASA summer, which is an interesting development. Um, okay, we, we just have to face that. What we have to do as an airline is to make sure we are as lean as possible. It comes back to Mr. McCorber, and uh, and we have a long way to go. So, make the staff realise that. Make sure they're they're involved and part of the process, and they can make their contribution. And uh, and and 
they have made a significant contribution. We lost 480 of them over the last 18 months. So uh, it's a high price to pay for an airline that gets it wrong. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And Christoph, in, in terms of Ryanair, I mean, two angles to, for you. I mean, one, you compete, but equally we hear frequently the media, the issues of they're a shareholder too. Uh, could you just comment on both aspects, competition and where is this shareholder issue likely to go? Are they going to have to sell up their stake at some point? I mean, you're truly competitors. Well, from a shareholder perspective, it can only be joy. Uh, we tripled the share price in the last three years and uh, paid 3.5% yield in our dividend. So <clears throat> that's good news. On the competition front, uh, not so good news because we took a lot of market share in the last three years, uh, particularly in the traditional markets to the UK. And uh, the customer is deciding that, not we. Um, and uh, I believe our business model has shown an extreme robustness against the competition and uh, also taking the most recent price uh, initiative which started on August the 3rd. Um, of course we have seen that, uh, we enjoyed it because it was quite calm in the market for the last four years so we are not shying away from the price competition but the customer finally, even if the ticket is a little bit more expensive, they appreciate that they arrive in Charles de Gaulle as opposed to Beauvais or in Frankfurt as opposed to Hahn or in Brussels as opposed to Charleroi. And they know exactly the value of a taxi ride from Brussels downtown to Charleroi. It's, <laughs> a, it's 100 quid. That's right. Yeah. And uh, if you value that with 20 euros uh, more for the ticket, the customer can easily decide and still extract more value from an Aer Lingus ticket than from a, from a Ryanair and ticket. And can, can, can take you two hours to get there as well. And can take you two hours. So I believe, no, no, it's, it's a very level-headed competition. As, as I said, the customer is deciding mm -hmm. that. Uh, and um, that, of course, we take as a big confirmation that we get it right uh, with the service, that we get it right with the pricing, and that we get it right with the schedule. Yeah, and on the air motor is no different. I think that, that uh, we, are, we know there's going to be a price differentiation. I mean, we can't get down to their cost levels. Uh, we, we actually now buy fuel, hedged fuel less than what Ryanair are buying it. Uh, and obviously that represents 30% of our cost, and, we, and there's still half our, our cash. So we, we recognise our position in life, so therefore we have to concentrate on doing something different. So the values of Air Malta is Malta, the values of Ryanair are Ryanair. So mm -hmm. it's an entirely different product, and yep. we have to approach that. So we concentrate a lot on being a destination airline, rebranding the country, and the airline was an important uh, part of what we did in the last couple of years. Uh, so you know, we, we know what we're trying to, uh, to focus on. And, and we need to create that cultural revolution to make sure everyone else knows exactly the same story. I mean, we talked about, we're talking about the context of this is challenges, but what you're both telling me is you're taking opportunities to, in some ways, take leaves out of a low-cost book, adapt your models, uh, and you believe in both cases that can be successful. You're delivering profits, you're bringing the company back towards the black where it hasn't been for a long time. I mean, Christoph, as well, for you, uh, I mean, Aer Lingus, you could say, has changed its spots more than once because it was a full-service airline. It had a business class. Uh, Willie Walsh came in and, uh, you know, saw the, the harps going past his window, as you do now, and realised it, it was change or die. But you've changed it again, and you, you now call Aer Lingus a value carrier. It got very close to arguably being called a low-cost carrier, but you're calling it a value carrier. How, how does that... How does the customer understand that? You gave some examples. Uh, can you just yeah, spell in it fact, out? it is a metamorphosis since the company was founded 77 years ago, and I believe every phase uh, is, is fulfilling its purpose. Uh, uh, you know, brands come and go. Uh, it all depends on what the customer wants. Mm -hmm. Nobody walks around with a Walkman today, because we have an MP3 player. Um, Value carrier, very uh, interesting. We had the decision um, uh, four years ago, should we go entirely to a Me Too low cost or shall we go back to legacy, none of which uh, really was, uh, was ticking the boxes for us. In, in looking a little bit forward, we predicted that the pure low cost model would have problems because you cannot source the aircraft at the prices you enjoyed in 2002. We predicted that the 
tax transfer via the regional airport deal will come to a standstill. We predict that the modal split uh, end, will end up in a certain saturation. We predicted that a multi-channel distribution is what is needed in the market, that online only is nice, but it's unrealistic uh, to be pursued. And, 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 so we decided basically to give the customer a choice. We always start with a simple transportation from A to B. You buy a seat. And that is the price you can compare with Ryanair. That is basically where you make 10, 20 euros difference, but never more than that. And then we give the customer a choice to add a pre-ordered meal to a free leg room, a fast track security, lounge access, uh, what have you. So you can assemble basically from that simplicity of a seat, you can assemble your own business class product. And um, we enjoy huge satisfaction both on short haul and long haul uh, with that concept. Uh, of course, we are one of the very few carriers, maybe five in the world, having an IT system supporting the super PNR. Um, that is a disadvantage we discussed last week with regard to Yatta's new, uh, new distribution um, initiative. Mm. Um, you have to be able to do that. Um, but we are in a lucky space. We are able, and uh, again, put the customer first. The customer will take the right decision, and uh, if they buy your product, uh, you should be encouraged to do more of that. And Peter, you talked about selling, uh, selling the service aspects, you've made changes on pricing and so on, but you're selling Malta with an expertise of Malta. But if I could ask you both a question, but start with you, Peter, without being uh, impolite, you're both small airlines by the standards of, say, the legacy groups. If we talk about survival of the fittest in the competition and we bring back the, the dreaded R word Ryanair again, you know, uh, can, you, can you survive? Does Malta need its own airline? Does Ireland need two airlines? Or is Michael O'Leary right that if he, he puts his list up of consolidation in Europe that you should be the next part of that and go uh, even unwillingly into his arms, Peter? Everyone has the right to, uh, to uh, operate within the marketplace. So should Air Malta or should Malta have a national airline? Uh, why not, providing it can stand on its own two feet and, and, and you know, create profits? Uh, the advantage of, of uh, Ryanair to... Uh, and other low-cost carriers coming into water, as I said before, is that it's opened the market up uh, to a lot of people that perhaps um, didn't think of going to water before. Um, so I, I think that there's a, a sort of disbelief in terms of, of how you can operate against the low cost. I mean, the low cost are here to stay. There are issues at the present moment, and they're, you know, perhaps they might be wobbler slightly, but they're not going to go away. So therefore, I think we should still embellish the fact that they're there. Uh, you said earlier, you know, are we learning from the low cost? Of course we are. But at the same time, uh, we do have different philosophies in terms of, of channel distribution. Uh, we're a little more sophisticated in terms of how we approach the marketplace. And, and critically for us, it's, it's a question of selling that destination. Now, Air Lynx is in a slightly different position. Uh, it's more of a network carrier uh, than, than, uh, than us. But uh, I, I think we, if, if we look after our own um, resources, understand our purpose in life, and really drive down the costs, and not be compl complacent. There's every opportunity for us to compete against uh, Ryanair. Christoph, in a different position, as people um, say. Yeah, I, I'd like to uh, may, maybe make two points. The first one is the two-carrier policy for mm -hmm. Ireland. I mean, let's all recall, 15 years ago, the cheapest ticket you could get across the Irish Sea was £650 mm -hmm. on Aer Lingus. And uh, I think the Irish traveling public was suffering from that monopoly for decades. Um, that was when the high days of heydays of Holyhead uh, were. Um, it's an abandoned place today. Nobody takes a ferry any longer, or very few. Um, so Ryanair has liberated the Irish market, and I believe the Irish population and the Irish uh, politicians, they have learned that lesson very well and say we have to keep competition. That is the core of the ruling from the UK Competition Commission. Uh, forcing uh, the sale down of uh, Ryanair in Erlingus. So that point is clearly made. It's good for us. It was very painful in the beginning, but finally uh, the uh, only Ryanair has basically guaranteed the survival of Erlingus. We would be gone by now without any competition. 
um, counter, counterintuitive but true. <laughs> um, the second thing, can we survive independently? Yes, of course we can. Our balance sheet uh, is, uh, is able to lift a lot more weight, uh, I believe, at a, at a, at a gross cash, net cash uh, turnover basis. We most probably have the strongest balance sheet in the world. Uh, from all airlines, so that should guarantee at least uh, you know enough uh, safety net. Um, we are we have a home market of 70 million people. It's not only this is a 4.7 living in Ireland. This is a big misunderstanding. Um, I always explain it that our home market is abroad, right? Our home market is in Australia. Our home market is on the east coast of the United States and yeah. in the UK. And uh, we have in terms of where the expat Irish population lives. In terms of where our migration. tickets are bought. I will right, give you okay. one example. We are a European long-haul carrier, but selling 65% of our long-haul tickets in the United States. Right. That is unprecedented for a European mm. long-haul carrier. Yeah, right, right. And that is what I'm saying. Our home market is 70 million people with whatever kind of Irish relation. And I believe that gives us a justification really to promote our business model. Uh, everybody wants to buy us, surprisingly. We'll take it as a compliment. When you say buy you, I mean buy you as a business? Or buy you as a product? Obviously. I mean, the richest airline in the world is Ryanair with the strongest balance sheet. And uh, they have tried it three times. Maybe they go for a fourth time. But again, we take it as a compliment. They could buy every other one if they would wish. Be, what about be, the, be a <laughs> the, the challenge and the opportunity of government? I mean, Peter, you're, you're going for an EU-backed uh, uh, restructuring program involving state aid. We've, we've uh, touched... Uh, uh, on, the, on the other companies whose future is uncertain. Uh, Alitalia is who knows what is going to happen next. Um, is, it, is it legitimate to get these kind of uh, bailouts, if you could call them that? Is it legitimate? Mm -hmm. well, yeah, because it's been approved and signed off by the European Commission. So on that basis, it is legitimate. Um, I mean, Air Mortar and, and many other European airlines know how they got into that position. Um, and, and should they have got into that position, that's for other people to to answer. But certainly, I think if you can uh, uh, create an opportunity whereby you can justify that. Don't forget, you know, uh, it's not all state aid. We re-raised 230 million euros, um, only which half, or roughly half, was put in by the government. I mean, I've, there's no family silver left in Air Malta, uh, apart from two slots at Heathrow. No, you're not getting them. <laughs> um, and Because uh, uh, Heathrow's important for us. So there's nothing left in the cupboard, so we really have to make sure it works this time. And the EU rules are very specific in terms of, of going back to the trough. So we know exactly where we stand and what we've got to do. Um, is that legitimate? I think so. I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people got short mire, short uh, memories. Uh, you know, uh, Willie talks about, uh, quite rightly so, uh, I tend to agree, you know, should uh, alien companies be allowed to go to bus? Well, yes, if, if they can't put a legitimate plan together, then they should be. Uh, but he forgets under the Thatcher government, uh, she, she was quite kind to British Airways uh, many years ago. So I, I think we all come from, uh, from a similar background. Uh, and Ryanair lost money for, what, 20-odd years before they, uh, before they became into profitability. So I think everyone uh, doesn't have a right to lose money, but I think everyone has a right to learn uh, and, and learn from their mistakes, make sure we don't repeat those mistakes and move forward. The issue we have uh, is making sure that people think that there's no God-given right or that it's a private flying club uh, that the people can carry on as they did yeah. before. Because we talk about this uh, and the state aid one time last time and yet we have an uncertain situations like Alitalia is still around and seemingly asking for more. Uh, there's a mixed views about Chapter 11 of the USA. Is it a good thing or a bad thing? If we look at profitability of US airlines now, it's a mm. good thing they've got themselves seemingly Pretty sorted good, out. Yeah. But people say, well, they, they had enough chances to sort themselves out. Would that we could have had the same here in Europe? What's your perspective on this, Christoph? I'm thinking particularly about those comments you were making at this conference about the consolidation of the industry. Is government interfering in this process or helping in this process, would you say? Oh, well, that's a very difficult question. Let me first come to the chapter 11. Uh, there is no such a thing in, in Europe. Um, and uh, I would not praise chapter 11 as really something which, uh, which fits all purposes. But right. certainly every uh, company, maybe, it's not limited to airlines, should have a sec separate chance. It's called the examinership in some uh, uh, things. With the airlines, it's always busy, uh, difficult because you lose the AOC the moment you go into examinership and then the exactly, company yeah. is wiped out. But right. let me so to find an out-of-the-court agreement with your creditors, 
I believe is generally a very good idea. That tool is not available to European airlines. If that possibility is replaced by a one-off state aid, giving the breathing space to restructure and the money funded by the Italian post is going into the restructuring of the carrier rather than supporting unsustainable fare levels, that is a distinction we have to make. And it should be a one-off. Um, I stopped counting the Alitalia state aid over the last 15 years. Uh, that is really, um, no, I think it's not equal treatment. I, I have been in charge of Sabina when we had to put it into, into bankruptcy. As a consequence, uh, Belgium lost 5% GDP because the hinterland Africa was entirely cut off. If I would advise the Belgian government again, I would say they should put in funding mm. against the ruling of the European Commission. Mm. Is my thing, it would be legitimate mm -hmm. to give them the breathing space of six months to find a new shareholder and to fund the restructuring. Mm -hmm. Not to keep an unsustainable operation running for another six or 10 or 12 months. Uh, that, uh, that distinction has to meet. So I see state aid as a substitute for chapter 11 as a legitimate thing. Mm. I don't see it as a continuous uh, funding, funding of losses. Of an ailing yeah. business. No, I, I, I agree with that principle. I, the, one of the nuances about state aid is that well, a lot of people don't appreciate is that uh, we had to give up 20% uh, you know, of our ASK capacity. And, and not just those unprofitable routes. It would have been very easy to say, well, we don't make money on, on A to B or C to D, so we'll, we'll stop flying there. We had to give up routes uh, and prove it which represented both profitable routes and non-profitable routes. So that was quite difficult for the airline to do. So there was a significant penalty uh, given to the airline from a capacity perspective in terms of creating additional profits, um, as opposed to simply, you know, well, here's a lot of money and get on with it. So, and, and, and Brussels, every year now, we have to submit uh, where we stand against our original plan. Uh, are there any uh, deviations? If so, what are they? Uh, why, why that's happened? So, there's no God-given right that that will continue. They can pull that at any time if they so desire, or if they believe that uh, we're going to, uh, to go against the principles of, of what the state aid originally approvals was about. Um, so it's, it's not just a question of, of well, here's the money, get on with it. But one of interesting angle on government, uh, uh, we've just seen the, the, the ending, or I don't know if it's actually ended, but about to end the Irish tourism tax, Christoph. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Ryanair's gone out, you know, all guns blazing, uh, promising uh, an extra million passengers to Ireland from next year. Uh, is that something that uh, you know, is going to give you opportunities in your home market? Uh, do, you, do you place the same weight that Ryanair is claiming to on this tax being repealed? Every cent is important. <laughs> and be it the airport departure tax or other uh, impediments we see from a, from a tax regulation point of view will help us. Uh, the customer will recognize that. And I will give you the adverse example, uh, particularly uh, important here for the UK. The UK uh, long haul airport departure tax results in, in funny things. The customers are very educated. They take a short haul flight from Prestwick to Dublin and then board an Emirates or Etihad flight uh, to Australia and if it's a family of four you save 500 pounds. Um, that is something you, you, you would not expect the customer to leave no, it on no. the table just for your country, right? Um, so I, I would say we have here the opposite example, a too high airport departure tax can really uh, turn traffic away. We saw that in the Netherlands, we saw that in Belgium. Uh, some countries have learned the lesson, one of which is Ireland. That's the reason why we fully support and appreciate that move. Um, let's hope it will never come back. And uh, we see our opportunities uh, similar to Ryanair. I think the airline industry has replaced the uh, tobacco industry. I think the, the politicians see the us as a, as a way of raising money because people are smoking less. So I'll um, be mm. slightly facetious. But, but uh, it, 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 the, the taxes are just uh, criminal. But it's not just the taxes. It's, it's, it's a lot of other issues that, that come from, uh, from Brussels in, in terms of how airlines could be more effective and efficient. And we, we much prefer... Is it becoming too much regulation uh, overall? Uh, yeah, the, the, European, uh, the uh, transmissions uh, or missions was a bit of a farce. Um, we all like to fly in straight lines. Uh, uh, yeah, we don't. We fly all over the place. And uh, that costs the airline industry within Europe 5 billion uh, 
euros a year. And, and God knows how many billions of tons of CO2 we actually put in. Actually, that's, I mean, do you think the airlines are making that clear enough to the public? I mean, living in London, I <laughs> see the holding stacks. And you think if you multiply the number of circles that every plane does every day, apart from the cost, that's the equivalent of flying across the Atlantic several times. So is the industry unified enough to get this message over? That well, there, 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 there's often been conversations about the fact that perhaps the airline should go on strike for a couple of days and see what happens to the world uh, economy. In fact, that did happen. Guess, With the volcanic uh, eruption. The volcanic ash. Mm. Uh, but I, I, the airlines didn't take advantage no. of it, in my opinion. But uh, no, it, 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 uh, I don't think... Uh, Interesting. I mean, we're members yeah, of the... Hmm? <laughs> Interesting idea. I never thought about that. No, no, but Give it a try. Yeah. Oh, if, you, if, you, if you think about airlines, and, and uh, if you go back to the jet engine, uh, and then airlines and what Airlines done for uh, changing the, uh, the, you know, the way in which we work around the globe is, is quite significant, and now we're taking advantage of. I don't think we're, we're, we're not crying wolf. We're not sobbing over uh, over uh, um, something that, uh, that's uh, disappointing to us. But I think the industry, uh, AEA and IATA, I, I believe, could be stronger in terms of making that point. Uh, but having dealt with with our friends and commissioners, uh, it, it's somewhat often frustrated. Now, in terms of growth opportunities for both your companies, uh, talking about small markets or, or Ireland has got, has got the dispersed population abroad, but it's also got this challenging uh, uh, outbound migration problem because of the, the state of the economy. But given the, the boundaries of your respective country and economy sizes, where do you see growth prospects? I mean, Christoph, you've, you're acquiring some more aircraft to do some new market, new US services from Ireland. Uh, I remember when We've talked before, you, you don't want to join an alliance, but you work with a lot of airlines in different alliances. You have a shareholder, aside from Ryanair, you do have Etihad as a shareholder. Where do you see as your development opportunities? And, and then, Peter, once you've got through this restructure, the same, where would you see opportunities for Air Malta? Yeah, that is certainly the biggest impediment for, for our company right now, the limited growth opportunities, because our, our home market is uh, still not firing entirely on all cylinders. So uh, we grew our capacity long haul this year 15%. We sold 16, 17, so a very, very good performance, um, uh, really uh, spilling low factors in summer. Um, on short haul, not the same opportunities. Next year, long haul, another 25%. That's basically where we work. It will have positive impacts on short haul because we have developed Dublin as a, as a very well-functioning hub. Um, so we will have transfers on our short haul services, but all that uh, is not enough for us. So we became creative, and uh, you might recall that we operated a long haul uh, flight for United from uh, Washington Madrid. to Madrid, mm -hmm. which was the first and ever use of Open Sky, which has been negotiated for 20 years. Uh, surprisingly, very successful, very profitable. Uh, we just started flying four aircraft for Virgin Atlantic, um, Little Red. On the domestic the meantime, flights here in the UK. Right. Uh, most punctual airline in, in London Heathrow, which uh, I think speaks for itself. We start flying a long-haul aircraft for a tour operator out of Scandinavia this winter for three consecutive winters. Um, so uh, we have more in the pipeline, more of that, uh, where we can make use of our rather competitive cost position and our experience as an operator. Um, but what, why did that Madrid-Washington come to an end if it was so successful? Was it just a, short, um, a, it a, a was, contract that... Run it was course. very successful for us. We would have loved to not only continue but to expand that. Uh, unfortunately, that was perceived in the US uh, pretty much as an outflagging attempt from United, from uh, their pilot body, and therefore was then abused a little bit as a stick, um, which you, you don't want to do if you are after a commercial exercise. So we both agreed that it would be too too valuable uh, to, to sacrifice that uh, uh, as, as just a negotiation chip on the table. We needed the aircraft ourselves, so that coincided with us cancelling the agreement and we have redeployed that aircraft very profitably uh, into the East Coast. Um, unfortunately, I would love to do more of that. But again, we are back to labour. Um, not every commercial idea uh, is perceived as a good idea. Sometimes it's perceived as a threat. And uh, that, of course, is questioning then the sustainability. Is, is that what your current cabin crew issue is about? Because you have these seven five sevens coming to do new flights from Shannon, yeah, yeah. and they're concerned whether you will outsource their jobs to wherever those aircraft are coming from. 
Uh, no, we wanted to fly that with our own cabin crew because mm -hmm. they have legendary good service, uh, particularly our, our crew base in Shannon. Um, unfortunately, the union didn't agree to the crew complement we had envisaged for that flight. We wanted to fly that with four as opposed to five, so we couldn't come to an agreement and uh, very regrettable for us mm. uh, and for the customers. Uh, we had to outsource it now. Um, um, not so nice. You see, you really have to convince your people. In this case, it was certainly not, not the singular employee, but it was the representation uh, where we had problems. Mm -hmm. I hope we can resolve that over the long term. And Peter, you mentioned you had to cut capacity as part of your restructuring arrangements. When that is through, where would you see your growth opportunities? Because well, you're I, an island, essentially. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I think there's, there's two very specific space. areas. One is that I, I think clearly mortar is, has always been <laughs> and will continue to be uh, uh, hugely strategic in terms of its location in the middle of the Mediterranean. I think something like 30% of the commodities that go into Chinese manufacture come out of, 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 uh, of West Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa. So I, I think um, uh, from a distribution point of view, logistics, uh, there's an ideal opportunity which obviously Air Mortar would like to take advantage. Uh, obviously we're going to continue attracting people to come to the country. It's a unique country in that respect. Uh, fantastic heritage, great culture. Um, and, and that appeals to a lot of people other than simply just Europeans uh, that, that come down on a, a three or four day holiday out of Birmingham or, or, or Frankfurt or wherever. So you've know, got millions of middle income people now in India and China and Southeast Asia. I think you know, we, we have to be far more far reaching in terms of, of introducing those people. For that we need connectivity and that we need, uh, I call them friends and relatives within the airline industry. We have a number of co-chairs. Uh, we, we can't afford to join an alliance. Uh, I wouldn't advocate that. And as a destination airline, um, uh, wreak havoc on our revenue management system. So I think we, we know where we are, but I think what we need to do as a country is, is to obviously punch above our weight. Uh, and we have the strength and basis of a, of a, of a solid, very interesting country, which uh, you know, I believe we should be espousing to lots of other people. So I think certainly from a, an industrial perspective, there's huge opportunities there because of its strategic position. And I think in terms of the tourist industry, there's no reason why that shouldn't de uh, de detract. Um, but I think we need to be far more uh, imaginative in terms of, of how do we reach other parts of the world. Thanks. Gentlemen, let's just see if we have a few questions from the audience before we get towards the end of uh, the session. It's quite hard to see here, so do we just put your hand up if you have a question. And uh, we've got a couple of microphones down at the back. Uh, gentleman down in the front, I know who he is, but let's let him announce himself. <coughs> Second row. Yeah. Uh, Malcolm Ginsburg, uh, Mr. Challenges. Air Lingus, uh, Lingus Regional Air Arab, Air Lingus Air Arab, or whatever you want to call it, is run now effectively by Air Lingus. It's all in the Air Lingus uh, management team. It's owned by Slovaks. Is it the policy of Air Lingus to continue in what appears to be a very successful arrangement, or are you going to buy them out, or what's going to happen for the future? Uh, Aaron is, is a success story in itself. I mean, let's recall they were in examinership three years ago. They got new shareholders. They have just uh, almost completed their fleet renewal, brand new ATR aircraft. Uh, they are flying under the radar. They have enjoyed growth rates between 20 and 45 percent over the last three years. It is selling light hot bread. One thing we would never consider to buy them because we don't want to kill them. So we are very happy with the shareholder structure they have. We have a franchise agreement uh, that keeps everybody sober. And uh, I can just hope that we can continue with that arrangement uh, because uh, the customers enjoy it. Um, even in competition with our own jets, the regional, uh, uh, the turboprop sometimes makes the race in customer demand because we fly it with four, five, six frequencies a day. So you have really that shuttle aspect between Edinburgh and, uh, and uh, Dublin. Very important, it's a financial community in Edinburgh, it's a financial community in Dublin, and these people want to fly on an hourly or at least two hourly basis. Um, so uh, they still enjoy our full support now and uh, going into the future. Gentleman on the front row, here have a question. Okay, if, if one, one at the back there, then to the gentleman here. Okay. So, so we've just got this gentleman before you. Okay. Just hold on to the mic a second. Right, this is a very short sort of aviation tourism uh, question to Peter. You recently had a tremendous change in your brand, appearance, in your livery. 
Has you have you got already some indication how successful this change was? Has it got your more customers, more people now trusting in the air motor? Yeah, it's, a, it's a, an important step forward. Uh, the, the, the image of the company uh, was, was very 1970s corporate, um, but, but, but the, the, the rebranding was, was not simply just a paint job uh, to make the aircraft look prettier. Uh, it, it was a, hopefully an intellectual approach in terms of how we could promote the country in a more effective way using the airline, because uh, obviously it's in the country's interest and it's equally in our interest. So I think that... Uh, uh, that seamless uh, introduction of a new brand has gone exceptionally well because it's obviously right the way through the company number one. Number two, uh, it was part of the cultural revolution, uh, quite significant in terms of the impact it had on our staff. And, and, and you know, before you try and convince customers to use the company, you've got to convince your own staff that, uh, that they want those customers to come and join us. So therefore, that was significantly important. Thirdly, yes, we did the, uh, you know, the pre and post survey, so we got a lot of quantifiable evidence in terms of how people perceive their mortar beforehand and how they see it differently now. We worked every uh, thirdly or fourthly, I should say, we worked very closely with the Maltese Tourist Authority, and certainly it has been a significant sea change uh, in terms of, of the impact, not specifically just on the branding per se. Uh, I, I, would, I would, wouldn't claim that, but certainly the tourist business in Malta is significantly higher as a percentage increase than many other countries. So I think that uh, we've made our contribution. Um, so for us, it was a significant uh, step forward and, and, um, and has had a desired impact. Fortunately for us, 76% of the Maltese public also like it. So uh, branding can be very object uh, subjective, uh, but we tried to make it very objective. Uh, we spent a lot of money making sure we got the research done properly. So uh, I'm pretty proud of that as a, as a, as a CEO and certainly the rest of the staff. Are. Gentleman on the front here. Obviously, most uh, areas like product quality has increased over time. The airlines, it's sort of gone the other way now. Some of that might be due to the uh, different, you know, due to different parts of travel and, and their expectations. Uh, but, but, but it's interesting. I think when I travel, one thing I don't, don't like is shocks. And uh, I was actually lucky um, um, a couple of months ago, so I managed to move my boarding pass up to the next encounter because it didn't make any difference. Um, if you look at some um, uh, some um, uh, uh, low cost carriers like Egypt, I think they, do, they are trying to go to up markets. I mean, if you look at um, your fellow centre shareholder, for example, they're renowned for very much, you know, this is the point, it's very cheap, but it's like uh, you get a cheap build, uh, you have them, um, you know, the charge for this, 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 you end up paying more. How do you see things going? Do you see the low cost um, model possibly um, having to uh, adjust as people expect um, a high quality product? Or as I said before, I think we are always in a transition. Nothing stands still and customer behavior changed. I see that as father of three kids. Um, and I believe you have to listen to the customer. Some customers are simply not prepared to pay for gimmicks, which were normal in the past, you know, business class with three newspapers of three different languages and a free meal and all that. Uh, if you deduct that from the ticket price, a lot of consumers would say, just give me the seat. Um, I'll take that with pleasure and keep the rest for yourself. Um, but even the, the most simplistic of all products, I believe, is not in contradiction with some form of friendliness. And, uh, you know, you have supermarkets of a different size, but the famous proverbial double bagger will make the difference. You know, it's not the price of the goods you have just purchased, it's, you know, how they are presented. And uh, I believe that is almost legendary in our industry. You see movies are made about nice flight attendants. I think it's, it's really an icon of the industry we should be proud of. We should cultivate that culture. Um, it contributes to the feeling of safety, um, which is in our industry very important. It, it puts people at ease. So I don't see that you should pay for friendliness. And uh, if some people put revenue expectation behind friendliness, I think it turns the whole thing on the head. Uh, I'm afraid to say, but uh, if you say you can turn the airline around in becoming more friendly, um, then you just make good um, uh, what you haven't achieved in the past, but you will not go be above the zero line, um, is my personal opinion. Peter, do you want to add a comment? I, I, I think uh, 
uh, falseness is uh, is is uh, very much off, uh, exposed. I, I think in the case of uh, certain low-cost carriers, you, you know what you're going to get, and, and uh, yeah, millions of people seem to be quite happy with that. Um, other airlines will, will differentiate their product according to the nature of, of what they're trying to, to sell. Uh, uh, that's why I say, from my company's point of view, the, the values of Air Malta are Malta. For us to differentiate that uh, in, in such a way that it would be low-cost and, and tacky, uh, would suggest to the buying public that Malta is tacky, and it's certainly not. So therefore, we're not going to portray that image. And, and, and I think your uh, notion of supermarkets is uh, is classic. You know, so the John Lewis is M and S, and you know, people are, are, are find their own levels. And, and uh, it's up to those companies as to decide what their products are going to be, given what's happening within the marketplace. And, and one sizable low-cost carrier seems to have woken up to the fact that. Uh, I remember the panel uh, two years ago, I said that you know, we could easily increase Ryanair's profits by 30% simply by being nice to his people. Um, and perhaps he's gotten on to that now. Peter, thanks very much. Well, I'm afraid we are running past... Uh, oh, perhaps one quick question, if you can be very Phil quick, Victoria. Victoria. I'll let you in. <laughs> Victoria Mills with ATW. Um, just a very quick question. Are things going to get better in 2014 or not in Europe? Christoph. <laughs> um, I believe for us it will certainly get better. Yeah, we, we are going through our restructuring program. Whether for Europe as a whole, Victoria, I have to say I studied a couple of airport statistics just the other week. And Germany, which is the strongest performing GDP country in Europe, has merely the passenger volume in all airports combined than previous years. So they are not growing at all. And that's the reason why, I mean, overall, from a macroeconomical ex uh, perspective, you have to be very careful. In London, the view is blurred because nobody has ever seen a boom like in London this year. Um, but that is very isolated. The rest of Europe is very sluggish. And uh, I believe better in terms of result, you can only if you manage your capacity tightly and you keep your cost under control. Um, that would be my answer, Peter. That's an interesting insight in terms of, of Germany because uh, we, we certainly recognise as Air Malta uh, in, in the last couple of months uh, that the, the, the German market is, is quite static at the moment and given that it's the engine of Europe, that's uh, quite worrying because a lot of our traffic comes from there. Uh, so yes, it, it's, it's interesting how that, uh, how that sea change is happening. Um, I think for, for the European, from our perspective, I think yes, next year has to be better because we, we need to make a profit next year. So, uh, and I assume that's going to happen. Um, although never assume everything, of course, but we're working hard to make sure that happens. I, I think there's a lot of other, which we haven't got time to discuss, sea changes going on within, within this global industry, which are absolutely fascinating. And, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you're just yeah, tempted. I mean, no, really, we, we, we are running a little over time, but I just because you mentioned <laughs> earlier on, the, the, I'll make this a very last question. Uh, and it could be a, a speech in itself, but Gulf carriers, opportunity or challenge. Emirates, if I'm not mistaken, is into Malta, aren't they? It Emirates. is, yes. Yeah. 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 We code so, with them. So, so Gulf Too carriers, long, yeah. opportunity or challenge for you, and you have them as a sh one as a shareholder anyway. So, Peter? Oh, I, I, I think, was it Tim Clark said the other day that he's, got, he's going to order a 90, uh, another 90 380s, taking his fleet to 180 380s. Mm -hmm. Next year, uh, into Sydney, there will be, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Five 380s daily. Um, from Emirates? From, no, no, Emirates and Etihad. And that's about BA. I'm not quite sure what BA do it. Uh, that's about Singapore, Japan. I mean, mm -hmm. the whole sea change in terms of, of uh, what that, uh, that airline or those airlines are doing uh, is, is quite. But uh, are, the triple are the airlines to be complained like, about or are the airlines to be uh, applauded? I think is what he wants. I, I think they're doing a fantastic job. I think uh, and I, I use them uh, and. and uh, Great levels of product service, um, yeah, if, and that's to a certain extent the success is based upon one aeroplane, the triple seventy R. It's just a brilliant aeroplane. Um, we're too small to operate those, but they're, 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 they're exclusive. You're not, you're not going I agree, to be down. I agree, I agree. You're not. Uh, <laughs> no, you're I'm not, not down I'm to the Dubai I'm, Air Show next no, I'm week. One, I'm one of those CEOs that don't go chasing new aeroplanes. I can't afford them. But, but uh, uh, no, seriously, if, if, if you look at what that aeroplane can do. Um, and, and, and not wishing to discount the Pacific totally, because you know, I did Mark Dunkley for running, running Hawaii Air, but if, if there's not one place I don't think that you can not fly direct from, uh, Dubai or, or Etihad with a 777ER. It just changes the whole uh, 
uh, the way in which people think about moving around the world, and, and that has will have a significant impact on legacy carriers in this country. In uh, well, certainly in this country, particularly in Europe, in but certainly US. within Europe. Yeah, and and that's where my my thinking in terms of complacency. I mean, I, I've been to so many meetings, AA meetings, which I can't necessarily disclose, but certainly where where people complain about someone else, and uh, well, Willie doesn't do that. He just gets on with it. And, and, Perhaps Christoph, you have one world is a good indication. I, I, I would, I would, be, I would be more sure. radical in my statement because finally the regulatory environment of traffic right is the only seawall left. Mm -hmm. In absence of traffic rights, the Middle East carrier will wipe the legacy carriers just out within 24 months. Oh, I agree. They will be gone on long haul to Asia. It's inevitable, and even that does not raise the sense of urgency. No, that's exactly right. It's, uh, I have to say goodbye. Yeah, you've got to go and run a for flight. a flight. Listen, Christoph uh, Muller, CEO of Aer Lingus, great to talk to you. Uh, fascinating to hear about the progress you're making in Aer Lingus. Thank you very much. Good flight back to Dublin tonight. Peter Davis, thank you very much. Pleasure. Good luck with the completion of your restructuring and a safe trip back to Malta. Ladies thank and gentlemen, you. thank you very much. We have a session tomorrow, half past two, when we look at the challenging question of runway capacity in the South East. Thanks very much. Have a good evening. Thanks very much. You better run.